All right, so good evening, everyone. And I wanna thank you all for coming to our third and what's our final event in our Coastal Connections series on the Quadi region. My name is Annika Smithson and I'm the co-host, I'm not the co-host, I am the host for Coastal Connections. I work as the Conservation Campaign Coordinator for the Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society New Brunswick chapter. For those that might not know, the Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society or CPAWS is a national organization dedicated to the protection of Canada's public land, ocean, and fresh water, and ensuring parks are managed to protect the nature within them. Here in CPAWS, we work to protect the wilderness we love and the natural areas we all need. To start off, I'd like to acknowledge that CPAWS works on the traditional and unceded territory of the Lulistique, Mi'kmaq, and Pascamohati nations. This territory is governed by the Treaties of Peace and Friendship, which were signed with the British Crown in the 1700s. They did not deal with the surrender of lands and resources, but recognized Mi'kmaq, Wolistikwe, and Pascamohati title. They established rules for what was supposed to be an ongoing relationship between nations. Indigenous peoples have and continue to steward these lands and waters. And at CPAWS, we are striving to listen, learn, and support Indigenous nations in this work. If you'd like to learn more about the Treaties of Peace and Friendship, you can take a look at some of the links that we posted in the chat. If you are from a different area, I encourage you to learn about whose land you reside on. You can take a look at nativeland.ca, which shows the territories of Indigenous people around the world. That link will also be posted in the chat. So just a few housekeeping things to go over. Um, I just ask that during the presentation, you remain on mute um, so that we don't have any audio jumping in. Um, and if possible, while Dr. Claire is presenting, if you wanna keep your video off, that'd be great just to ensure we have the best internet connection possible. We will be having a Q and A at the end and you're more than welcome to turn your video on and unmute yourself when you'd like to ask questions. Secondly, at the bottom of your screen, there is a little button um, entitled reactions, which has a bunch of different emojis. And if you'd like to interact with the presentation at all, feel free to use those um, during her talk. There's also a little speech bubble um, with the title chat. So feel free to pose questions, comments um, throughout the presentation. I have with me one of my colleagues, Emily, who's gonna be monitoring the chat. Um, to make sure that any questions that are posed during the presentation can be brought up during the Q&A um, and can be asked to Dr. Claire. So this evening, as I mentioned, is the third and final event in Coastal Connections, which is a speaker series we developed to highlight the Quadi region, which we believe is an incredible place in New Brunswick in need of protection. Um, to give you some context, I'm just going to share my screen and show you a little map of where the Quadi region is located. Can everyone see the map? Yes. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. So the Quadi region encompasses Passamaquoddy Bay all the way out to Point La Pro and down to Grand Man Island, um, just along the coast of New Brunswick and Maine. And Tonight, we're going to be having Dr. Claire from the Huntsman Marine Science Center speak to us on diving back in time, underwater changes in the Quadi region over 40 years. So Dr. Claire Goodwin is a research scientist at the Huntsman Marine Science Center and is curator of the Atlantic Reference Center Museum. She studies the marine biodiversity of Canada and many other areas, including Europe, the Arctic, and the Antarctic. Much of her research has involved scientific diving to collect specimens and survey habitats. Her warmest dive was in 28 degree water and her coldest dive was in minus 1.8 degrees water. 
which is pretty cold, I think. <laughs> she specializes in sponges and has described 82 sponge species new to science. So I'm very excited that she's agreed to speak with us tonight and share some insight into the work the Huntsman is doing. So I'll turn it over to her now and she'll take it away. Sorry, I'm just gonna work out how to share my screen. There we go. I think that's the right screen. Yes, you're good. That's great. <laughs> okay, thanks very much for the introduction, Anika. As Anika says, I'm a research scientist at Huntsman Marine Science Centre, and I'm going to talk to you tonight about our project, um, Diving Back in Time, which is looking at underwater changes in the Quaddy region over the past 40 years. This work is funded by the New Brunswick Environmental Trust Fund. So, the work we're basing this project on is a resource inventory survey carried out by Art McKay and his Marine Research Associates. And the purpose of this survey was to catalogue the shallow water marine resources of the Bay of Fundy. And it was done largely by scuba diving. And this was in the very early days of scuba diving. And um, the sites that Art surveyed were surveyed between 1964 and 1978. And that was over 40 years ago. And you can see here, this is Art McKay um, getting ready for a dive with his colleague um, going into the waters. And the way Art surveyed the sites was two different methods. Uh, the first was simply going in and doing what he called a spot dive. So he went down and looked at the habitats and species that were present and just recorded them on a survey form. Um, so it's quite a, a quick survey. They normally spent about 30 minutes in the water and it really gave a good baseline of what was present at the site. Um, most of the species were rec recorded um, semi-quantitatively. Um, that means they were just recorded as present, common or abundant. So really the divers were using their, their knowledge of the area to come up with those abundant scales, because obviously what's abundant for a lobster, which might be saying seeing 12 lobsters during a dive, wouldn't be abundant for something like a sea squirt where you'd want to see about 100 or so in a dive to make it abundant at the site. So it's really knowing, uh, using their experience of the area to come up with those semi-quantitative abundances. That's a recognised survey technique in marine biology. At some sites, and these were much fewer because it took much longer to survey a site in this way, and they laid transect lines. So you can see here, this is a diagram from Art's report of one of the transect lines laid on the seabed. And here, what they do is lay a line for 100 metres along a seabed. And this could take several dives to survey. And then at each point along the line, they'd be three metres apart, and they'd record the abundance of the species at each point and the habitats that were present, the substrate that was present. So those two were the main um, ways they surveyed sites. An art survey really was quite extensive. It covered um, seven different areas and zones. And you can see here, Passamacordy Bay, Deer Island and Campobello, um, Back Bay and Latang, Grand Manam, which isn't on this map, the Wolves, P Point to Point La Pro, and then Point La Pro to Cape Spencer. So really they surveyed quite an extensive area of the coast. And from each of these areas, they produced one of these reports, um, which documents the habitats and species present in the area. And this really is the baseline for much of what we know about the marine life in this region. Art State has been used for a lot of different studies. Um, Maria Innes Bezetta used it for her master's work, uh, project work, which was looking at ecologically and biologically significant areas in the Bay of Fundy. Um, EBSAs, as they're known, are areas which are important ecologically, either because of the species diversity that's present there, or because they perform some sort of important functional role in the ecosystem. And some of these EBSAs are now going on as part of the marine protected areas process to become um, marine protected areas. The Western Isles in the Bay of Fundy, which is the area, I'll show you a bit about that in a map in a minute, um, but it's the area on the outside of Deer Island, was recognised in 1984 as a, well, 
from arts work as a particularly diverse and important brain area and from the other research that was going on in the area too from different um, researchers. It has been quite extensively studied this area because of the presence of one of the oldest marine biological stations in Canada and also Huntsman's been operating here since the 1960s. So it is um, quite an important area it's been recognised as and it was the report was done into it in 1984 as the feasibility of it becoming a national marine park. Um, it didn't actually become a marine park as a result of that, but it has been highlighted. It's a very diverse and important area. And here's the Western Isles region. This is the Western Isles on the outside of Deer Island. And it's a very diverse group of islands. It's composed of around 40 islands, numerous islets and ledges and underwater shoals. Some of these islands have cliffs up to 90 metres high and they're both exposed shores, for example, on the outside of Whitehorse Island and very sheltered areas, for example, here uh, around the north end of Deer Island. Underwater, the habitats are similarly diverse. And this is one of the regions that things that makes the region so special, the very diverse underwater seabed topography. Um, it's got charted depths of up to 125 metres, and there are many, many subtidal cliffs, underwater rock features, uh, but they're also protected soft sediment areas where you get completely different um, species living. Um, you can see here, this is just a diagram showing the seabed, and this is created from multi-beam sonar. Um, and this map, was, this was produced by University of New Brunswick's Ocean Mapping Group. And this is from a resource we're developing, an interactive resource we're developing on the area, which will let people explore the marine lives and habitats funded by Digital Museums Canada. And that'll be accessible from next year when we launch the website. Um, but you can see here on the multi-beam data, the blue areas are very deep water and the red areas are the shallower water. And what you've got here on the end of Deer Island Point is a narrow channel. So the water comes whizzing down this as it comes in and out of Passamaquoddy Bay. And we know that Passamaquoddy Bay has some of the highest tidal ranges um, in the world. So the Bay of Fundy has some of the tidal, highest tidal ranges in the world. And each tidal cycle, about two and a quarter billion tonnes of water go into Pasamakori Bay through these passages. So this, in combination with the seabed, sort of range and depths in the seabed, creates very strong eddies and currents and whirlpools. So here off the end of Deer Island, we have one of the largest, second largest whirlpools in the, west, in the world, uh, the biggest in the Western Hemisphere forming. As the seabed, the current sweeps over this deep area of seabed and is forced up over the shallower area of seabed off Deer Island Point. And these tidal currents and upwellings also create very nutrient rich waters and they're some of the most productive waters in the Bay of Fundy. And that provides a very wide range of food for different species. So I'll just show you the seabed in another area of the Bay of uh, the Western Isles. And here the seabed isn't so dramatic. This is around Sandy Island and Spruce Island. You can see there's still quite a big drop off um, here down into blue deeper water here. Um, but in between the islands, there's a bit of a more sheltered area, which is more gently sloping. But there's still quite a lot of underwater rock features as well. So when you start looking under the water, um, the seabed's just as diverse as what you're seeing above the water. And from these very productive waters, that gives us the enormous marine biodiversity. So we have um, over 20 species of mammal. We know this area is a critical feeding and rearing area for finbacks, minkies, humpbacks, and right whales. Although we now know the right whales seem to be moving on to different feeding grounds. Um, there's over 70 species of birds present. It's a critical feeding, breeding, and staging area for birds. There's over 836 different invertebrate species. 
they're very diverse uh, because of all those different habitats which give different species places to live and they're very characteristic of eastern Canada and also 223 species of algae. The aims of our study Oh, sorry. As I said, it's to go back and resurvey some of these sites. The study is a partnership with Art McKay and the Beskota Magadi Nation and Anais Le Courcier and DFO. Um, the Beskota Magadi Nation are actually a housing arts archive of survey material and perpetuity. And we've had a summer student this year, Signor Anderson, who's been helping to organize that and digitize some of arts material for them to hold on to, and that was funded by Eco Canada. We're revisiting sites that were last surveyed for over 40 years ago, and we're going to compare the data that we collect from these sites to arts baseline data to just assess changes in species and communities. Eventually we've collected enough data, and we do hope this is gonna be a multi-year project. We'll be using multivariate statistics to examine community change and relate this to various environmental stresses, for example, agriculture, global warming, fishing, shipping. And from this analysis, we hope to develop a suite of bioindicator species. So these are species that will tell us, hopefully, when there's been an environmental impact at a site. For example, we might find a particular anemone is uh, very sensitive to physical disturbance or it may be sponges, um, we find they're much less diverse if you've had a lot of pollution at a site. We won't know this until we've done the analysis um, with the pressure data. And as I said, this year is um, one year, year one of a proposed three year project uh, depending on funding. So these are art sites in the Western Isles area. And um, he, surveyed a vast number of sites over the course of his survey. The ones on the left, the black dots are his spot dive survey, so they were the quicker surveys, and the circles on the right um, are the transect sites. So he managed to survey 30, 12, 13 transect sites in this area. Those are the ones where the line was laid over the seabed. And we've been able to go back to Art's original data forms and would be comparing our data to these. Uh, the data was also digitized and put into a database by Maria and Bezetta, so we have access to that as well. And you can see Art was recording the species diversity, their present um, abundant frequent at the sites. And for a lot of the sites, he did these sketch maps. Obviously, the GPS technology that we use now wasn't available when Art was doing his surveys, but the sketch maps enabled us to get back to the right sites and go and resurvey the same locations as Art was surveying. And this is the Spectacle Islands. And there's a nice diagram of how they put the boat here and the divers went off um, and went around the dive site. Actually, when Art was diving, um, you can see they've got Art there with a the straight line and Bob with the dotted line. Uh, the divers were able to dive individually. Uh, we're not allowed to do that for health and safety reasons now, so we stick together as a dive pair. So we are able to cover a bit less ground than Art was able to do on his dives. And diving has changed in other ways as well. So I'm just gonna do a comparison here between our surveys and our surveys. Um, Art was diving from a skiff with an outboard, so a sort of fairly small open boat, or the Donaghy or the Delphinus, which were larger survey boats. Uh, we're able to dive from our research vessel, the Fundy Spray, which is a nice, um, comfortable research vessel with a heated indoor cabin and a, a marine toilet, which is very nice to have on long dive days. Art was diving in three, three eighths of an inch wetsuits. So you can imagine diving in winter in the Bay of Fundy in a wetsuit isn't much fun. Um, whereas we're diving in dry suits and we've also got dry gloves. These actually keep our hands dry when we're diving. Um, Art was diving on single 72 cubic foot air cylinders, whereas we quite often dive on two tanks. So we've got a reserve air supply. Art has a single hose Poseidon regulator, whereas we have a regulator with an octopus or an extra regulator, which our body can use in the occasion uh, of an emergency. Art used um, the mechanical depth gauges, 
whereas we used dive computers. Um, Art was recording his observations in pencil on underwater paper, whereas now we can take housed underwater cameras down with us and take really good imagery of the seabed. Uh, we've also been filming most of our dives this summer with a, a GoPro video system, which with lights actually records a really good quality video underwater. I was hoping to show you some of the video in this presentation, but we decided that Zoom probably wouldn't um, survive it. So I have got some of the still photos to show you later on. Art was entering his site on uh, data onto a site form after the dive in pencil. Um, and that bit hasn't changed. We're still doing that. And we've kept our survey forms as similar to arts as possible. Um, so our data is uh, really comparable. So again, um, these are some of the survey sites that uh, we revisited. Uh, you can see on this, um, these are our sites, the stars, and our sites are the dots, the red sites are the ones we went back to. Um, we got funding for 10 days diving this year, so we were able to go and resurvey 20 of our sites. And what I'm going to do now is take you on a tour of just some of the sites we went to and show you the diversity of habitats and species that we're finding in this area. So the first site I'm going to take you to is Black Rock. And Black Rock is an isolated rocky pinnacle. I'll show you where it is here. It's just north of Casco Bay, northeast of Casco Bay Island. So it's in this area here. And to zoom in on the chart, um, this is Casco Bay Island and the red dots are our survey sites. And this is Black Rock here. And you can see it's incredibly steep um, around the rock. Um, this is 100 metres here. The seabed's dropping off to 100 metres. And you've got 85 on that side of it, 65 metres on that side and 47. So it's got deep water all around it. And because it's a shallower water area, you're going to get strong tidal currents sweeping up over that. Uh, and that provides a great deal of food for filter feeding organisms. So a lot of the site has these very steep rocky cliffs. Actually, the area we went into was a gully. So there were two cliffs, one on either side of us. And every inch of the surface of that cliff is covered in filter feeding organisms. We've got, these are horse mussels here. Uh, we've got northern red anemones. Uh, we've got a lot of sponges, a lot of hydroids, which are related to anemones, but it's sort of colonial. And um, very big lobsters. In between the rock walls at the site, we actually have a horse mussel bed. Um, horse mussel beds are very important communities. They're recognised as a protected habitat under OSPAR. Um, they form dense biogenic reefs, they're called on the seabed, which are sort of reefs but made out of animals and dead horse mussel shells. You can see here there's a lot of horse mussel shell, but the actual live animals are probably buried down underneath the shell and you can't really see them very well in this picture. Um, so horse mussel beds provide a lot of structure on what would otherwise be sort of fairly flat, soft sediment seabed. Um, they also provide a really important place for animals to settle and to grow. You can see a lot of these are covered in hydroids. Um, we've got a lot of hydroid turf, all that brown stuff, fuzzy stuff is hydroid turf. And there'd be a lot of smaller animals that settle that we can't see in this picture. They can be a very important settlement substrate for larval larvae of species, for example, um, the commercial scallops um, often settle on horse mussel shells. And you can see they attract a lot of animals to feed on the horse mussel. These are absolutely gigantic um, common sea stars which are feeding on the mussels in the bed. As I said, um, the area is very important for filter feeding animals. So we've got um, anemones here, the northern red anemone. And here we've got a lot of different species of sponge just in one small area of rock. Um, so you've got these big encrusting sponges. This is Tedania. Um, 
I've had to take samples of this because I'm not sure what some of them are when I see them underwater, but hopefully in time we'll be able to identify them all from pictures. And you can see here they're brachiopods and the brachiopods even have sponges on the shells. And again, uh, another area and slightly different, uh, the diff slightly different areas. This is slightly overhanging. So it's got a slightly different community with these uh, polymastia sponges which have these um, feeding structures on their surface. And just very diverse, each area of this bedrock is completely covered in life. Okay, so the next place I'm going to take you to is Sandy Island. And this is a more protected area. Um, we actually dived three sites in this area between Sandy Island and Spruce Island. So you can see here the red dots are our survey sites. Um, the dots are actually the site position we went in on the site of. Um, for this dive, we actually swam off the weir and came up through this channel. So we did survey a big area. And for this one, we went in here and then surveyed further south. So the dots mark the start position of the dive. So it's more protected and actually at Sandy Island, there's an old weir which gives a habitat for some animals to colonize and plants. And um, you can see here, you've got sugar kelp growing on the weir and lots of hydroids again. And it's quite common to find lumpfish um, swimming around the weir. But you also get um, this species, this is a sea vase, and this is actually an invasive species. Um, in New Brunswick. And that's becoming quite common at a lot of the sites now. I'll talk a bit more about invasive species later. In the soft sediment um, between the two islands, it's a protected habitat um, there, so you get quite a soft sediment. Um, there's a bit of tidal flow, but it's protected from the worst sort of wave surge. And the tides maybe aren't as strong as in other areas. Um, and in this area, we get these vast um, colonies, uh, sort of numbers of individual burrowing anemones, and this is northern burrowing anemone, which is quite beautiful when you see it underwater. It's got really long, white, translucent feeding tentacles. And as well, we get burrows, which are housing a variety of species, such as this lobster. But further south on the tip of Spruce Island, um, you've again got quite rocky habitat, maybe a bit more protected than the area we're looking before at Black Rock, but again, um, covered in sponges. In this one picture, we've probably got about six or seven different species of sponge. And now I'm going to take you on to Little Latite Passage. So again, that's a very, very tight swept area. Um, you can see here it's um, in between Pendleton Island and it's the, the way a lot of boats come in and out of Passamaquoddy Bay. And it's got quite steep walls to the passage, but the bottom of it isn't in quite as deep a water as some of the other areas. Yeah, down in the bottom of the passage, it's around 15 metres um, there in the bottom of the passage. And again, um, because of the strong tidal flow there, um, it is very strong, the current there. You really only get about a 20 minute, a 30 minute slack water window on the tidal cycle. So we were lucky to be able to get in and get um, slack water to survey it. And you can see there's a steep rocky wall um, again, covered in sponges, um, but different sorts of sponges that we to what we were getting at the other sites, different species of sponge. And we've also got a very high abundance of these stalked sea squirts, and these are called sea potatoes. So you can see here um, a very high abundance of uh, sea potatoes. and um, quite a few different species of sponge. I did try to collect some samples of sponges to identify at this site. Unfortunately, it was completely slack on the dive, 
but when we came up to the surface in the dive, we were caught in a, a type of a, a very strong current whirlpools. We were on our safety stuff and being turning head over heels in the water just because the current was so strong. Um, and I did manage to lose all my sample bags. So we'll have to go back and resurvey that site next year and collect some more samples. And again, underwater, um, at this very tight whip site, a lot of very tight whip sites, you get um, bedrock covered in encrusting pink algae, which is what you can see on the rock here in between the sea urchins. And that's quite characteristic of very strong tide um, swept sites. And here we've got a sea raven, um, quite well camouflaged on the rock there. The next site I'm going to take you to is Adam Island. And that's up, Adam Island's uh, one of the larger islands here. And then on the south side of the island, there's quite a protected cove in there. So here we go, here's Adam Island. And um, the area we surveyed, we went in here and we started swimming out towards the, um, it, the, the south along that cliff. So again, it's quite a rocky habitat we were serving. It did have some soft sediment beside it, um, but it's quite different to the other rocky sites we're serving because it's um, more protected. So when we go in underwater there, it's much more heavily silted. Um, we're actually shallower too than we were at many of the other sites. There's more seaweed present, like this um, large sugar kelp and some porphyra as well. And there's very high um, crustacean diversity. And what we were finding was the crabs uh, were burying into the soft sediment uh, beside the rocks. So quite a lot of Jonah crabs. And actually we did find sponges were um, very diverse there too. Um, this is a different species of sponge, which seems to be associated with soft um, sediment environments. So it seems like quite silty areas. And it's a species called Seabrites. We think it's Seabrites fecus, um, which is a species that's also found in Europe. But we are doing genetic and taxonomic work on it because it could turn out it isn't the same species at all. Uh, we tend to find that a lot with sponges when we look at them a bit closer. Actually, um, the ones that occur in different areas are quite often different things. Um, so this is a Seabrite sponge, and these provide habitat for animals to live on them. You can see there's quite a lot of um, encrusting growth at the base of this one here, um, but they also provide habitat for animals to live inside them. Uh, sponges are filter feeders, so they take water into a network of channels within the sponge, and you actually find quite a lot of different species take advantage um, of those channels to live inside the sponge in a nice protected environment with a good um, flow of water coming through and food. And as I said, uh, very diverse crustaceans at this site. So you can see all the Jaina crabs here buried into the sediment. And lobsters as well. So although it's rocky, because of the protected nature of that site, it's quite different to the other rocky sites we were looking at. So, We've just started sort of going over our data, but I wanted to talk to you a bit about some of the things we might be expecting to find as a result of this survey. Um, so we may find changes due to climate change. Uh, for example, this is the Northern Basket Star, Gorgon Kethlis Arcticus. And we know it was quite common in this area during the time of art surveys over 40 years ago. You can see here the dark dots, the dark circles are where it's abundant. Um, the three quarter circles where it's common and the half shaded circles where it's present. And then the other ones where it's white were where it was not recorded. Uh, so that's important to show in the diagram. But you can see in the Western Isles, at most of the sites that aren't surveyed, it was present. And at many of those, it was abundant. We have been back to many of those sites. Um, you can see Sandy Island and Spruce Island was one of the sites it was abundant at. And we have not found a single basket star. Uh, we do know that the Gulf of Maine is one of the fastest warming wa water bodies in the world. Uh, it's particularly over the last 10 years. 
And this is a northern species with an Arctic distribution, and it was at the southern end of its range in, in this area. And it could be that its range has shifted north with climate change, and we've actually lost it from this area. Uh, we are keeping surveying, and I'd be very interested if anyone has got records of the species um, more recently than our surveys. Uh, we're probably going to try and do some citizen science, um, it, it get people to submit their records for it. Um, but it could be something that has disappeared with climate change. Some other issues for the area are invasive species. Um, there are quite a few things that are becoming more common, and um, particularly um, sea squirts or ascidians are some of the invasive species that could pose issues. Um, so we have a couple of species that we know are present in the region. This one's Didemnum vexillum. Um, it's also known as the pancake batter tunicate, or very nicely, sea vomit. And it does look um, not very nice when it's on the rock. It's a colonial species, so you can't see the individual ascidians there. It's a, the colony is composed of lots of individuals in uh, uh, zooids, ascidians. Um, you get quite a lot of different species of colonial ascidians, so just because you see something that looks a bit like this, you can't assume it is Didemnum vexillum. And um, we are getting better at recognizing it, but you really do have to send it off for sequencing um, to identify genetic sequencing. So I've got several samples, I think, of the species from our surveys this summer, and I will be sending off for genetic uh, analysis and taxonomic work uh, to confirm its presence. Um, it was confirmed in Nova Scotia in 2013, and we have got previous records of it from this area. Um, but it is something that could be increasing. One of the things it does is forms very, very large patches on the seabed, and it will smother animals that are present in the region. Um, so it can outcompete them for space. Another invasive ascidian species is the sea vase, and I did show you that earlier on Sandy Island Weir. Um, it has been present in New Brunswick since 1852, but large populations of the species are much more common since 1997 or more recently, for example, 1997 in Nova Scotia. And again, um, this species could outcompete some of our native species for space. Um, and we do notice that some sites it's becoming very, very abundant. Um, so we'd be comparing what we find with what aren't recorded and see whether we really have got an increase. Um, and I'll be keeping my eye out for new species to science as well. Even though this area has been reasonably well studied, and uh, we've got the Marine Biological Station here in Huntsman as well, uh, we are still finding things we don't know in the area, particularly sponges, which are an understudied group. Um, so we recently recorded two species new to science, including uh, Crelomima mequibezimbeginita, uh, which was named in partnership with the Passive Coordination. And um, I think there are probably several new, other new species present. Uh, so we have been sampling sponges as we go through the survey and other species of um, marine life. As well as uh, finding new species, we're hoping to resolve some of the taxonomic problems with species that are here and actually quite abundant, uh, but we don't really know what they are. Um, so it actually is a couple of anemones we're really having issues with. So this species here is the northern red anemone. And in all the ID books around here, it's being called Ertesina felina, which is the dahlia anemone, which is quite a common species in Europe. Um, it isn't this species. We think it might be a related species, Ertesina equus, but it could be also be another species as well. Uh, and I've been collecting samples. They are quite hard to identify. You have to look at um, tissue from them and look at the form of their stinging cells to be able to identify them. And it is pretty tricky to do. Um, and nowadays people do that in combination with the genetic analysis to um, determine the species. And I'm working with a Russian um, anemone expert and we're sending off samples to her. So hopefully we'll get a proper name. It could be we've got more than one species in the area that look quite similar. Um, so we'll be looking for physical characteristics to tell those apart if that is the case. Again, another issue is the burrowing anemones. So we have these very large burrowing anemones, which are very common in the area uh, between Sandy Island, Weir and Spruce Island. 
and also in other areas uh, around the region. Um, and currently, um, taxonomically, they're considered the same as these anemones, which are a much smaller burrowing species. And um, we really don't think they're the same thing, but we're trying to get specimens to confirm this. And the problem is um, these anemones live in one meter long tubes. And as soon as you try to sample them, get dig them out of the sediment, they shoot down into these tubes and you can't actually get the anemone. Um, so we're trying to find good ways of sampling these species so we can get some specimens um, to find out what they actually are. Um, so future work we're doing, we have finished the survey work now and we're in the process of digitizing the data from the first year. Um, we've started to identify and catalogue the specimens and all the specimens from the survey will go into the Atlantic Reference Centre Museum, which is a partnership between Huntsman and Fisheries and Oceans Canada. And they'll be available there, both as a record of that they were actually found at these sites and also for people to study in future, if people want to go in and do future taxonomic work on them. Uh, we'll be looking at data on pressures in the area and we'll hopefully continue this project for additional years so we have a really good data set to analyze and understand the changes that have taken place in this region and this is joe um from kojo dove and joe george who is one of our survey team um encountering a, a very large lobster on simpsons island um, so I'd just like to say a few a quick thank yous to people before we go on to questions. Um, so I'd like to thank you, thank Cynthia Howland and the Best Greater Magoli Nation for Housing Arts Archive and working with um, them to digitise that. Uh, Pat Fitzgerald and Gabby Libby from the Fundy Spray, your vote team. Um, Andrew Cooper from Fisheries and Oceans Canada, who's helped with some of the survey diving. Um, Joe George, as I said, who was part of our, our dive team, and Dave Goodwin from Huntsman. Um, Maria Zinsbizetta and Michael Strong, who've been invaluable in supplying their knowledge on marine life of the area. Uh, Rebecca Milne in the Huntsman Taxonomic Lab. And uh, of course, our funders, um, New Brunswick Environmental Trust Fund and Eco Canada, who funded our summer student. Um, so I think that's everything from me. I'm going to stop screen sharing now if I can remember how to do it and then we can take some questions. Oh, how do I do it? Here we go. Perfect. Thank you so much, Claire. I definitely loved seeing the abundance of species on the seafloor and those colors were so vibrant on a lot of them. So sometimes I forget that there's lots of color underneath the water too. Um, so as she said, we're going to open it up for questions. Um, so if people uh, would like, you can unmute yourself, turn your, feel free to turn your video on, we can have a discussion. Also, if you'd prefer, you can pose your question in the chat and we'll be sure to uh, read that out for you. Um, but we've got about 10 minutes or so, so feel free to, to ask away. I have a question. Sure, sure. go ahead. When you're talking about an invasive species and one of the ones that you had came from the Pacific, I can understand something moving around from the Northeastern Atlantic, but how does it get here from the Pacific? That's a good question. Uh, well, they come in various ways. Quite often they come on shipping traffic. So in ballast water and things like that, they can be introduced with aquaculture. Um, yeah, normally human. <laughs> Humans okay. bring them in basically. <laughs> Thank you. I'm just having a look at the chat to to. Um, I have a question, a bit of a follow up question on that with invasive species. I'm curious if uh, you know of or if the Huntsman is working on any initiatives to either remove or study or like stop the spread of invasive species and if so, what that might look like um, in a marine context? Uh, we do actually have one project. It's run by our education department. It's looking at um, green crabs, which are invasive. Um, so we have um, actually a tagging project, tag a capture and release to see, try and estimate numbers of green crabs in the area. Um, so that's quite a cool initiative run by the education team.
We do have some questions in the chat as well. Mm -hmm. um, Bethany asks if you need any volunteer divers. I'm assuming that might be in reference to sampling. Yeah, I mean, it'd be really nice to be able to incorporate volunteer divers, but we're um, limited because we have to dive under Canadian Association of Underwater Science regulations. And that means that everyone that dives with us has to have a minimum level of training. They have to have a commercial dive medical um, and they have to, we have to do sort of checkout dives before they come and do diving with us. But certainly something that Huntsman is looking at developing in the future is maybe a, a program where volunteer divers can submit their records um, because they're diving independently. They're not diving as part of a work project. Um, that, that's, that's fine under the legislation. So we do have something from Brenda Orr in the chat. So for the last 20 plus years, I've spent time each summer on Fish Island, which is very, which is very near to Deer Island. I see Art had a dive site between Hardwood Island and Fish Island as part of his study. What has been most noticeable to us is the, is the decline in the nocticula around fish over the last several, several years and the buildup of silt from the nearby aquaculture operation. Does your study include interviewing the fishermen or people that work on the waters in this area? Well, that's a good question. And um, so we haven't actually been at that, that particular site yet. And I know it was one that Art mentioned was a particularly diverse site. So we are hoping to revisit it next year. So I, I can't comment on changes in the area yet. Um, and re-interviewing people, we haven't really had, it's, it's been quite a small study. And we haven't had a chance to interview people, but I have had people during the course of the project come and talk to me, like local fishermen, and uh, I have had a chat with a few people, and it would certainly be interesting to do that. Uh, I think there's a lot of really important data that can be gathered by um, talking to people. So maybe it's something we're, we're trying to develop in the future um, to get more information about this area in. Great. And then we also have a question from Rose. Um, does the invasive face species have any known consequences besides space? Well, that's a good one. Uh, well, really, it, it's the problem is it competes with the native species. So, yeah, it, it's mainly a space issue, um, but also to some extent a food issue. Um, so by being there, it's displacing other species that would naturally be there. Great. And we also have another question from Bethany. Um, have you surveyed under any old aquaculture sites that have been abandoned? I notice not much seems to grow under the cages. Mm. Uh, we haven't actually been to any aquaculture sites as part of this study. Um, it'd be certainly interesting to go back and see what happens after a site is um, disused and see how things recolonize, but it isn't something we're doing as part of this project. Mm -hmm. Okay, we also have something from Mel. So you mentioned climate change being a possible threat to the area. Can you talk more about other threats there are to local species? And what do you think could be done to ensure protection of the species found in the water around your island? Oh gosh, that is a good question. Um, <laughs> uh, there are obviously quite a few different things that can impact the marine species um, in the area. So things like um, agriculture obviously having an impact. Um, uh, bottom gear fishing is known to have an impact on communities. Um, yeah, so there, there's lots of things that are having an impact. We just don't know at this point how much from this survey, we're not gonna be able to tell exactly how much um, impact different things are having. And that's one of the things we're hoping to be able to start to try and untangle by using the historical data and our new data and the data on pressures um, to try and see whether particular areas are being more affected um, than others. Uh, maybe by a combination of factors, not just, not just one factor. Um, 
So certainly some things that could be done to ensure the protection, uh, maybe introduction of um, zoned marine protected areas. I mean, that's what the marine protected area programme is all about. But obviously that has to be done within local consideration for local livelihoods and industries and in consultation with local people. So it's a, it's a big process. And I, I think um, there are some talks going on at the moment, um, but certainly nothing concrete has been decided. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And there is another question from Kathy. So is there much plastic garbage in these areas and how does it affect the species? All right, well, yeah, as in a lot of other ocean areas, there, there is a lot of plastic garbage, mm -hmm. um, both sort of big pieces of garbage and um, microplastics uh, are now becoming a known problem. So, I mean, it's having an impact at all levels of the food chain. It can affect um, seabeds by entanglement. It, things like sea turtles we get coming in will eat bits of plastic. But also, um, even right down at the bottom end of the food chain, uh, we're doing a study at the moment on plankton and different projects and looking at the microplastic within them. And they're ingesting microplastic fibers, the tiny basis of the food chain have microplastic fibers inside them. And obviously as things higher up in the food chain eat them, that's progressing higher in the food chain. And it's not only plastic, um, that um, plastic is associated with um, contaminants. It can accumulate things, chemicals on it, which can be harmful for organisms as well as the plastic itself. Um, so yeah, uh, plastics are having a, a big effect and they continue to have an effect. So we had another question from Mel. So are you diving at the same time of year as the previous study? And do you notice if the water is increasingly warmer year to year? Oh gosh. Well, our survey was done at various different times of year. I mean, he dives pretty much continuously throughout the year. Um, so we can't guarantee when we go back and survey the sites, we're surveying the sites at the same time as art did. But luckily for marine environments, it doesn't really make a, a big difference to the species you're recording. Um, so we're able to do that. Um, I've only been in this area for five years, and I think it would be very hard to say that you've personally documented an increase in water temperature, uh, but I know other scientists have. Uh, and they're noticing uh, water temperatures warming. If they look at it, they've got really good historical data sets on water temperature, and um, there, there is a, a documented change. Don't think there are any more questions in the chat so far. I have just a question about digitizing the material. So you've talked about getting arts material digitized and then having this available. Um, where will it be housed and can the public view it or is it only going to be for scientists or people that work in like, research stations? All right, well, the, the archive is going to be housed by the Besco Timogori Nation. Um, so both physically at their office in St. Stephen um, but they're also going to have a digital um, archive. And I think it will be publicly accessible. So I think um, you might need to contact them to re request a password. Um, but I think the idea is, is for it to be as widely accessible as possible. And there's a vast amount of material there. It's um, all these survey reports, uh, the original survey data. Um, there's actually a lot of, um, not in the early surveys, but from the 90s um, video data and photographs as well. Um, so eventually the idea is that will all be digitized and available, widely available. Great, thanks. So yeah, I think we're just coming up on eight o'clock. So if anyone has any last minute questions, we can probably take one or two more and then we'll wrap it up. All right, I think that's that's the end of the questions. Oh, got one more from Bethany. What is your favorite sea creature? Oh gosh, that's a really good question. 
I don't know. There's so many different ones and they're, they're all great. Um, I think, hmm, around here, I do really like the lump, lump fish. I think they're so nice to see underwater. Well, you get the big ones and you also get a species called the spiny lumpfish, which is tiny and you get them off Deer Island Point at the campground. They're about this sort of size. So you have to be really sort of eagle-eyed to spot them, but they're really bright colors, sort of orange and purples. And they're, they're just really, um, they're, yeah, they're really cute looking, really little spiny, um, massive eye. Um, so they're, they're a really nice species. They're really nice to spot on a dive. Great. Well, thank you so much for uh, presenting um, on the work that you guys are doing. And we look forward to seeing what results come out and hopefully you get funding for the next two years of the work. And um, yeah, so it's really interesting too to hear how biodiversity can play a role in understanding the health of the ocean and using it as an indicator um, and making sure that um, we protect those areas, like you said, in consultation with local communities and being aware of the social impacts and the economic impacts that can have. Um, so at CPAWS, um, we're very involved in uh, the Quadi region and looking to protect the area. And we encourage um, people on this call, if you're interested in ocean protection, to get involved where you live. And if you'd like to stay up to date in the work the Huntsman's doing or that Dr. Claire is involved in, um, you can for sure check out their website. They've got lots of information on there about different projects as well as events that might be coming up. Um, if you'd like to learn more about what CPAWS New Brunswick is doing for marine conservation, you can check out our website um, as well as our social media pages. And Emily will throw a couple of links in the chat for you guys. Um, and as this is our last event, I just wanted to note that we're going to be sending around a short feedback form to all participants that might have participated in one or all three of our speaker events. So I hope that you'll be able to take a few minutes to fill that out. It'll definitely help us with our future programming and making sure um, we're providing uh, information and events that are interesting to you guys. Um, and the recording of this event will also be sent out to those of you that registered. So thanks again, Dr. Claire, for um, spending your evening with us and sharing all about your fascinating research. And thanks to all of you for joining. I'm so glad you guys were able to be here and I just wish you all a good night and thank you. Thanks very much for everyone for coming and listening. That's great. Okay, thanks, Anika. I'm, I'm going to head off now, but.